صلى الله عليك يا مولاي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك أيها البشير النذير والسراج المني السلام عليك وعلى ابنك المظلوم الشهيد أبا عبد الله الحسين السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين ورحمة الله وبركاته بعد أن سيستة السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أزي كت سي بي إو بي سيك ماي فويس So you have to bear with me tonight, inshallah, be, be patient. <coughs> and inshallah, we'll begin with the last salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa being the perfect human being, the perfect human, with the best qualities and the best characteristics. Ultimately, ultimately Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa should be our role model and his life should be a lesson for each and every single one of us with his stories and the qualities and the attributes that he had so tonight inshallah I will mention a few from the many 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 um, qualities that the Prophet sallallahu had through a few stories of uh, throughout his life and then inshallah Sheikh Ayman will continue with the majlis sallallahu Muhammad wa ala Muhammad <coughs> Firstly, we'll speak about, inshallah, how the Qur'an was brought down to the Prophet The Qur'an has the physical aspect of it, the physical reality of the Qur'an. There's a physical reality, which is the Qur'an that we hold with each, with each other. You know, we read Qur'an together and the brother was just reciting Qur'an. This is the physical Qur'an right here, this one. Physical Quran. Whereas the Quran, the essence of the Quran came down on the to the heart of the Prophet. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna anzalnahu fi laylat al-Qadr. Surely we have brought it down. We have brought it down. We have brought the whole Quran down in laylat al-Qadr. In Shah Ramadan. So the whole Quran was brought down in one piece. But it was the metaphysical part, the spiritual part of the Quran. And this came down to the Prophet straight away. Whereas the physical part of the Quran, when it came to, you know, this ayah, you have to come and balligh this ayah, balligh this ayah, you know, al-yawmu akmaltu lakum dinakum, hurrimat alaykum, you know, once he wants to come and speak about specifics, he would wait for the particular thing to happen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would wait for the particular thing to happen in history, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will then order the Prophet, okay, ya Rasulullah, now speak about this ayah. Now speak about this ayah. Now speak about this ayah. Oh, this, they're burying the children alive. Speak, speak about burying the children alive. The daughters alive. They're speaking about killing the innocent soul. Speak about now through the, the Quran, killing the innocent soul. So, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi came and he began to balligh. The wahi. How did the Quran come down to the Prophet sallallahu Also two ways. There was the direct, divine... Uh, connection which was called Wahi which was directly from Rasulullah to Allah SWT direct link Rasulullah to Allah SWT then you had the second way which was through Jibreel Bil Wasita so there was an intermediate between the two when there was an intermediate like Jibreel السلام, it was easy Allah SWT would speak to the Prophet through Jibreel Whereas when the Quran would come through the wahi, through divine, through the divine connection through just Allah SWT and Rasulullah, it was extremely hard for the Prophet. Reason being, 
Because like we said a few nights ago, if my brothers and sisters remember, we said the human being is a composition of the body, the physical body and the spiritual aspect, the soul. So when Allah SWT is speaking to the Prophet, He's not speaking to the body of the Prophet, the physical body of the Prophet. He's speaking to the soul. And the, the soul of Rasulullah is the strongest soul of all souls, of all creation, of all mankind. So he's able to take more than any other human being. For example, just to you know, bring it closer. This is, a, this is a cup of water, yeah? Let's say this holds 500 mils of water. 500 mils. So I put 500 mils. Can I put 2 liters of water in this? As much as I pour, it's going gonna, it's gonna to fall out, correct? Because it doesn't withstand, doesn't hold 2 liters of water. It's not because the water is bad. It's just physically, it just doesn't, it's incapable of taking it. So, if I were to get two liters of water, a bottle of two, that, that gallon, and put two liters of water, it would be able to take it in, correct? So, Rasulullah, his spiritual, his spiritual, the soul of Rasulullah was able to connect to Allah SWT. But the physical body of ours isn't able to connect to Allah SWT. The physical body of ours. So when the Prophet would be in that session of wahi, when he'd connect to Allah SWT through wahi, he describes a companion that comes and asks him, he says, Ya Rasulullah, when Allah SWT is speaking to you, when there's divine connection, how do you feel? He tells him, it's the hardest thing that I could ever feel in my life. What do you mean? He explains it to him. And the way he explains it, it's like, how can I explain something you've never felt before? It's like, for example, how can I explain to you how hungry I am? You could never understand how hungry I am, or how thirsty I am, or how sad I am, or how in love, how in love I am. You can't understand it. What I can do is I can give you examples. For example, I love her as much as your mother loves you. Oh, I'll give you an example. You know, I came and I brought it closer to your mind. But the essence of my love, I can't explain it. But I can explain to you a mathematical equation. 2 plus 2 equals 4. Because that's outside. Whereas when you're talking about inside, inside myself, the inner, the inner meaning, I can't speak about how thirsty I am and how hungry I am. And I also can't speak about how painful this is. When I'm in pain, when I'm going through pain, I can't explain how painful this is. But I can explain it to you through examples. Oh, it's like, you know, someone hitting me with, you know, a shovel, for example. You know? Oh, that's how it feels like. So, I can't explain to you the reality of it. So, Rasulullah, when he, this companion comes and asks him, How did you feel when Allah SWT was directly speaking to you? And he gives this example. He says, It was as if, and imagine this, brothers and sisters, put yourself in this scenario. It was as if I put my ear. Do you guys, have you ever guys watched these movies, the old movies with the massive bells, the big bells, with the me massive metal bells, you know, and that come and hit it and they go ding, ding. That, that everyone understand what I'm saying? Yeah? Okay. So it says that wahi to me was like me putting my ear on that bell and the strongest man on earth hitting the bell from side to side. That's how wahi was to me. It would make me shiver. It would make me cold in the, in, the, in the hottest of nights. It would make me cold. It would make me shiver. It would physically drain me. Physically drain me. Not because Rasulullah is weak, like we said. It's not because this bottle, this, this, this cup isn't, is weak. It can't hold too late. It's the, physical, the physical aspect of this cup is 500 mils. It doesn't hold any more. Rasulullah is the maximum capacity of perfection as a human being. But the physical body itself, if you were to put fire on it, if you were to put fire on this physical body, it's going to burn. It's going to burn. Unless you put something to, you know, put a bar make a barrier between your hand and the fire, it's going to burn your hand. It's the physical, it's cause and effect. The law of causation. Cause and effect. So, Rasulullah comes and explains to us the pain that he used to go through when he was taking this wahi in. But he says also, and this is the quality that I want to touch on. He says, if it wasn't for my tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I would never be able to take in wahi. It was the tawakkul. Him being able to put his hand, metaphorically speaking, not literally, his hand in the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always be with him. That's what kept Rasulullah standing. That's what kept Rasulullah being, being able to be patient. So tawakkul 
Rasulullah teaches us uh, through the hardest of things in his life as, a, as physical pain. Then I want to go to the second point, which was patience. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi in the gorge of Abu Talib. And this is a beautiful story, brothers and sisters. He says there was about 40 leaders. And this is at the beginning of Islam. And Islam was just becoming the thing. And Rasulullah maybe had maybe 5 to 10 to 20 companions. He didn't have a lot of people. About 40 leaders of Quraysh gathered together to surround Bani Hashim. 40 leaders of the hypocrites and the kuffar. They surrounded Bani Hashim. What did they want to do? They want to pressure them. So, Hamza, everyone has probably heard of Hamza. Hamza being the uncle of the Prophet, this guy, every single person in Mecca, in the Arabian world, was scared of Hamza. So to come and fight Hamza, no. No one, no one wanted anything to do with Hamza as a personal fight one-on-one. -on -one. So they had to outnumber him. So they came, 40, 50, 60, depending on the rations, and they come and they surround them. They, bani, they pressured Bani Hashim, pressured them, and then Bani Hashim, for those who don't know, is the tribe of Rasulullah It's the grandfather, and it's the tribe of Rasulullah, also the tribe of Muhammad salam, the tribe of Hamza, no, no. So they wanted to come, force them to leave Mecca, force them to give up, force them to stop spreading Islam, force them to give up Rasulullah. That's what, they, that's what ultimately their goal was. So, a few men gathered in Masjid al-Haram in Mecca and they agreed to cut their, cut, they cut their ties between Bani Hashim. Mind you that Bani Hashim and Bani Quraysh are cousins. They, they, the essence well, it was from the same tribe. They were cousins. But the people in Bani, Bani, Bani Quraysh are, for example, Abu Lahab. So Allah SWT says, and Bil'an, personally, Allah SWT Bil'an Abu Lahab. But he was part of Quraysh. So, Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So he comes and Abu Lahab comes and he says, you know what, I want to pressure Rasulullah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut all ties from the Arabs and Rasulullah and Bani Hashim. So he begins by not allowing anyone to trade with Bani Hashim. No one was allowed to buy or sell from Bani Hashim. And Bani Hashim weren't allowed to buy anything from anyone. So that was the first step. They continued. They weren't allowed to buy rent houses. They weren't allowed to buy food. It was a complete stop. They just wanted to completely finish Bani Hashim. So, they wrote a treaty and they said that no one is allowed to buy, sell Bani Hashim anything. They're not allowed to let them rent their houses, they're not allowed to give them food and whatnot. And they stamped it on the Kaaba. This is the Mushrikin. They stamped it on the Kaaba. Abu Talib, every night at sunset, he would go to the Prophet because now it's at a time where, okay, we're still trying to establish Islam. We're still trying to establish Islam, but we're still, it's still shaky. And they want to kill you, Ya Rasulullah. So Abu Talib comes, and everyone's heard the story where Imam sleeps in the bed of Rasulullah, correct? It was Abu Tal Talib's idea that Imam sleeps. So he goes, he tells Ya Rasulullah, Look, you're under attack. People want you dead. People want you this. People want you that. So it's better if every single night you wake up in the middle of the night and then you leave your bed and my son, Ali ibn Abi Talib, comes and sleeps in your spot because Ya Rasulullah, they want you dead. They want to kill you. So it was Abu Talib's raising, the way he raised his son. And then you have, unfortunately, some people come and say that he's a mal'oon and he's in Jahannam and, you know, Abu Talib. There's obvious reasons behind that, but Abu Talib raised his son in this way so he can defend Rasulullah So he slept in the bed of Rasulullah and he defended him. Abu Talib then, Abu Talib by the way brothers and sisters was one of the strongest figures like we said in Arabia. But not only physically strongest figures, he was financially one of the strongest 
and he was one of those people like you know how in in the Quran we say Andu Ime is like one of those people that you know he was he's up there he's got a name and people will look up to him so Abu Talib took the decision he spoke to Rasulullah took the decision to leave Mecca it's time ya jama'a we leave Mecca because khalas it's to reach the state where the one is dead Sallallahu Alaihi Muhammad wa Muhammad Thank you very much because Abu Talib felt like every single hour we stay here, every hour we remain here, there's going to be a fight, there's going to be a war. So it's better for me to leave and to take them. So he takes them to avoid this danger. He takes them to a place called Sha'b Abi Talib. And this was located, according to Hadith, around 500 meters to a kilometer outside of Mecca. So he takes Rasulullah and his family and a few other people, a few other companions. And they set up tents and they began to live <coughs> to live in exile. And this lasted, brothers and sisters, for around four years. Four years they, they lived in this situation. And inshallah, I'll explain Allah, the depth of this, this situation they were in, the depth of and how hard it was for them. Sayyidah Zahra alayhi salam, according to different ahadith, she was six or seven years old at that time when they were exiled, when they were exiled. Being this, this, this period being very difficult for Rasulullah and especially because it's the early stages of the Risala, of the message of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Rasulullah felt tired He felt like he was letting everyone down But he, became, he began to invite everyone so he'd personally by himself go to Mecca him and Imam Ali salam and, and he'd go to Mecca and he'd try and, you know, speak to the youth, speak to... He wouldn't stop, he didn't just stop there. So everyone was exiled, but he'd always go back and he'd try to speak to the youth and try and, you know, bring people to, towards Islam. Although the, this wasn't, because like we said, he wasn't far away from Mecca. So, then the Mushrikeen felt like there's something going on, there's a revolution going on. So they were going to open war. So Rasulullah stopped, he went back, and now it's, it's becoming harder and harder, they're closing, they're closing more on him. So, he, be he begins to invite people to Islam. The youth and the slaves, they begin to accept Rasulullah. They begin to accept him, they begin to come to, uh, what do you call it? So, the other tyrants like of Mecca, like Abu Lahab for example, Abu Jahl, and others, they saw that they had no choice but to force the Prophet, Khalas, okay, you are completely exiled and if you were to come back here, khalas, death, war. So Rasulullah now, he leaves completely and leaves the city. Now think about it. Think about this. They were exiled for four years and they were in Mecca. Mecca is a desert. In the daytime it's extremely hot, but at night it's extremely cold. Extremely cold. And for those who have been to Umrah or to Hajj, they will understand what I mean. It's very cold and it's very hot as well. Rasulullah had to be exiled and had to accept being exiled, not only for himself, but for his children and for his companions and for his young little Fatima alayhi salam. He had to accept her and they had to live in these, in, in these extravagant, hard conditions. So they done so and they lived in those conditions. Rasulullah would always find that Sayyidah Zahra alayhi salam, by the way brothers and sisters, it was at this time where Sayyidah Zahra alayhi salam was called Ummu Abiha, the mother of her father. It was at this time. Because Khadija, because they were in such a financial hardship at that time, because everyone was closing off the Arabs, they wouldn't let them do anything, they wouldn't let them buy anything. So anytime they'd want to, you know, buy, for example, for example, they'd want to buy water, they'd want to buy food, they'd want to buy flour to make bread, let's say it would cost a dollar, they'd increase the price to 10 or 15 dollars for Bani Hash, so they can break them. They'd increase the price. And if Bani Hashim were to sell something, they'd reduce the price by 10 or 15 times. So someone would ask a question, where did Bani Hashim get all this money from? To be able to live for four years. Aslan, how'd they live for four years? 
even at, in the black market, they, they didn't want uh, Abu Lahab and the Mushrikeen, the hypocrites, didn't want them to live through the black market. Imam Ali Al -Salam would go every day in the black market and try and buy food and whatnot. And when they found out, they almost started war as well. But a question is, how did they buy all this stuff? How did they live for four years? Through the wealth of Khadija That's why the hadith says that if it wasn't for Abu Talib and Khadija, if it wasn't for the wealth of, Abu, uh, of, of Khadija and the strength of Abu Talib and the sword of Ali, no Islam. It wouldn't be any Islam. Islam was built on these three. Islam was built on these three. On the courage of Abu Talib, on the wealth of Khadija alayhi salam. Because if it wasn't for the wealth of Khadija, who's going to buy bread for 15 times the price in mid-Arabia in, in that time? But Khadija alayhi salam was known to be one of the wealthiest, if not the wealthiest woman, if not the wealthiest person in Arabia at the time. So she was able. A couple of years pass. Sayyidah Khadija alayhi salam passes away. And Abu Talib also passes away. In the same year. And this is getting harder and harder by the Prophet. If you realize, brothers, the, the events that are occurring, it gets harder and it gets harder and it, get, it gets harder. It doesn't become easier for the Prophet. Sayyidah Zahra alayhi salam in narrations, like we said, she's around six or seven years old. And her mother's passed away. But she'd, she'd be walking with her father and she'd be like, Ya, ya Abata, Aina Ummi. Where's my mother? She doesn't understand what's going on. Although at that time, and if you want to go scientifically, we'll speak scientifically as well, but at that time, a girl by the age of six or seven years old, maturing in the desert, would be equivalent to that girl now at the age of 11 or 12. That's what historians and scientists say. I might be wrong, Allah alam, but that's what they say. So Sayyidah Zahra salam, although she was six or seven, she was much more mature than her age, but she'd ask, as, there's so many events going on, Ya, ya, ya Rasulullah, there's so many events going on, what's happening? Where's my mother? Where's Abu Talib? But she'd always realize there's one person that's always there defending her, always, one person that's always sleeping in her father's spot, always he'd stand in, in front of her father to defend him, which was Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. She, she realized that. So, Sayyidah Zahra salam would provide emotional care for Rasulullah Rasulullah is going through this hardship right now. He's going through a hard time, you know, and some of his companions are leaving him, some of his companions are coming. It's just it's all over the place. And then Sayyidah Zahra salam would be the one to go and calm him down and talk to him and, Ya Abata, what do you need? I'm here for you. She'd wipe his face, she'd wipe his head, she'd wipe his teeth, anything you need, well, I'm here for you, you know. So she, she was the emotional basis of her father at that time. Because Rasulullah was a leader. He had to show, he had to, had to be a leader. But when it came to Sayyidina Sayyid Zahra alayhi salam, he would open up to Sayyidina Zahra alayhi salam. Ummu Abiha. This wasn't just like one of those you know, I'm Dalla Ibn, I'm Dalla Binti type of things. No, no, no. This was this is reality, brothers and sisters. So under under extreme circumstances, Rasulullah is able to nurture and bring up a daughter who becomes worthy of the Prophet, kissing her hands. It says Zahra becomes worthy of Rasulullah kissing her hands. And one might come and say, in the wallah he's kissing her hands, that's his daughter, it's emotion, it's stuff. So yeah, and mark his daughter but kissing the hands is something big especially back then in Arabia when you were to kiss someone's hands yeah, yeah, this person deserves the, yeah, this, yeah, yeah, he deserves it even if it's your daughter even to yeah, yeah, someone might come and ask why didn't he do that to all his wives Rasulullah why didn't he do that to all his wives but it's his wife as well but he didn't do that to all his wives so Rasulullah kissing the hands of Sayyidah Zahra alayhi salam also is a message. <coughs> so Sayyidah Zahra alayhi salam elevated. She reached stages and states, levels where no other human being could reach. Especially at, at her age. In some narrations she passes at, at 18. She's married at 18. In some narrations at 25. But the young age of hers, still, the qima, the level, the spiritual level, 
تلاقوا ان جنة سيد الزهراء عليه السلام ليس لها مثيل ask, ask رسول الله why did they call her فاطمة he says لأن فط... ف... الله سبحانه وتعالى فطم الناس عن معرفتها الله سبحانه وتعالى has it's impossible for the human being to understand what Fatima is عليه السلام to reach the, the level of Fatima عليه السلام that's why there's another hadith that if it wasn't for Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, there would be no kufu for Fatima alayhi salam. And if it was, kufu means there would be no equal to Fatima alayhi salam. There would, yani Sayyid Zahra, in, in other words, would never be get, get, get married in her life if it wasn't for Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. And opposite, and if it wasn't for Fatima, Imam Ali would never get married to a woman of that level. Of course, Imam alayhi salam married other women, but to his haq, to his right, no one, there's no one that reaches the level of Muhammad alayhi salam like Sayyidina Zahra alayhi salam. No one. Sallallahu alayhi Muhammad wa alayhi Muhammad. So, Rasulullah went through hardship, went through tough times, and Imam alayhi salam stood by him, and Sayyidina Zahra alayhi salam stood by him, and he was patient. He was patient through every single, and I really encourage my brothers and sisters, whoever, whoever has time, whoever feels like they're encouraged and motivated, to read the story, this, this specific story about Rasulullah and what he went through in, this, in those times, what he went through through the balad that he went through, through the Arabs, what they used to do to him. If you read that, you understand how patient he was. Now we'll get to another story, and this is the third story, inshallah. Which is the story of Imam Ali and Sayyidina Zahra salam. And I want to talk about the, the humility of Rasulullah and how he gave this beautiful, magnificent daughter to this very beautiful, magnificent man. In what way? What was the manner? Like we said earlier, Sayyidina Zahra salam is the daughter of a king now. Rasulullah is a king. After they've finished the, being exiled and whatnot, it becomes a king. Inshallah, we'll speak about it in a couple of minutes. But Sayyidah Zahra alayhi salam is the daughter of this Prophet, Nabiullah, you know, hierarchy, he's up there. So a person would come and say, Wallah, Sayyidah Zahra alayhi salam deserves X, Y, and Z. You know, but the Ahsab Yod, she needs cars, she needs houses, you know what I mean? In our day and age, you know? then she needs camels and horses and whatnot. Someone might come and say that because of you know, the level she's on. But it was on the contrary. Sayyidah Zahra alayhi salam looks that I want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's all. And I feel, I, mean, I realized that when Rasulullah, my father, alayhi salam, was going through hardship, there was one man that stood by him, which was Imam alayhi salam. One man. Sayyidah Zahra alayhi salam was wanted by many. At the age of nine years old, she was wanted by many. For example, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf. He's, he's a person that's, that came and he proposed to Sayyidina Zahra alayhi salam. Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, brothers and sisters, and this is a story for each and every single one of us in, the, in our day and age. He was very rich. He approached the Prophet for Sayyidina Zahra alayhi salam. He may have thought that well, the money was his way through his wealth and whatnot. And some of us, unfortunately, feel like that is the answer. Well, if I have this much money, if I have this many cars, and I have this house and whatnot, khalas, I'm set, I'll get married. So he goes and he goes and tells Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, I'm willing to give you as many camels as you want, as Fatima wants, alayhi salam. And I'm going to cover these Egyptian ca these camels with Egyptian cloth. And I'm going to provide her a thousand gold dinars. So basically, he's, you know, what he's put in front of her, Allah Alam what it's equivalent to in nowadays wealth. The Prophet Sallallahu however, could never be bought by money. But in any case, what he does is, he still goes to Sayyidina Zahra Alayhi This is also a, a big lesson for the, the parents as well. Inshallah, we'll all become parents one day. Although he knows that this man isn't for Fatima, although he knows that this man's trying to buy my daughter, although he knows that this man is a bad person and whatnot, he goes and he asks Fatima, what do you think? He goes and he asks her, 
Abdul Rahman Rauf, one, two, three. And she says, no. The fact that he went and asked Sayyidah Zahra is a lesson also. He asked Sayyidah Zahra alayhi salam, what do you think? Yes, no, do you want him? So she says, no. Then Abu Bakr, for example, comes. Abu Bakr asks for the hand of Sayyidah Zahra alayhi salam. And then he would always say, await what your Lord has ordained. Now Abu Bakr, just wait. So he'd go and he'd ask Sayyid Zahra alayhi salam and Sayyid Zahra would say no and then Omar tried again and you know Sayyid Zahra would say no. And historically speaking that was a, a reason why uh, uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi would ma had married Aisha and married Abu, Bak uh, Abu Bakr's daughter Aisha and Omar's daughter Hafsa. Because Arabian tradition and culture back then was if you give ta'atini bintak wa'atik binti. You know? If you give me your daughter, I'll give you mine. So if you marry my daughter, if you if I marry your daughter, you marry my daughter. That's how it is. So they all said, Oh, Ya Rasulullah, come marry my daughter so nahna we can marry Fatima. Marry Aisha so we can marry Fatima. Marry Hafsa so we can marry Fatima. But she had nothing, she, she wanted nothing to do with it. And then a few men come few of the companions of Rasulullah and, and friends of Imam Ali salam they come to Imam Ali salam and they say Ya Ali, what are you doing? Ruh, ruh, ahki, thank you, go speak to Sayyid Zahra, go speak to Rasulullah, tell him you want his daughter, do something. Imam Ali salam says, what do I have? I have nothing to offer. And this is exactly how Rasulullah was by the way. He was very, he had the humility. What can I give Fatima alayhi salam? He knows that Sayyid Zahra alayhi salam, is, she's up there. What can I give Fatima? He says, I only have three things. My sword, my camel, and my shield. That's all I own in this world. Imam alayhi salam. So, <clears throat> the companions kept on encouraging him, encouraging him. The Prophet won't ask anything of you. They tell him, you know, trying to... You know, give him confidence and motivate him and whatnot. Imam Ali Salam is Qala Abab Khaybar and you know, the courageous one and everyone from Fakr Halak Imam Ali, he's strong and whatnot. When it came to this specific topic, he was shy. He was khajul. How am I going to speak to Rasulullah about his daughter? I have nothing. So he goes the first day and, you know, he looks at Rasulullah, he wants to ask him a question. Qas, he says, I'll leave it. Second day, he goes, you know, looks at him, also he leaves it. Then third day comes, and he goes and he's looking at Rasulullah, and then Rasulullah, because he doesn't want to put him in that situation, he comes and says, Ya Ali, do you have a question? Do you have anything to me? Do you want to say to me? Do you want to fish here? Rasulullah knows, of course, he knows what he wants. Yani. It's not something hidden. He knows what he wants. But he goes, Shu Badakshi, Fishi Rasa, thinking of something. And he tells him, Yes, Ya Rasulullah. Shu Badak, the Prophet knew. But he tried to make it easier. He told him, Have you come to talk to me about my daughter Fatima? He opens the Maldu. He, he comes and speaks to me. He tells him, Do you want to come and speak to my daughter? Is that what you're coming here for? Look at the humility of Rasulullah, by the way. Nowadays, if a father, were, if you were to go and marry, want, want to marry a, a, a sister from, in the community, I don't know about here, like I said, I'm always speaking about Sydney or Lebanon. I don't know anything about Canada. All right, Sydney or Lebanon. If you want to go and speak to a girl, unfortunately, her father, I all in Arabic, بيعمل عنطر, you know, he sits like this, you know, doesn't say, doesn't laugh, doesn't smile, nothing. You know, what do you want to come? What do you want? What do you want? You know, and try and make him laugh. If you make him laugh, you've won his daughter. But try and make him laugh. You can't make him laugh. It's just like this. And it's like he, it's like he is God sitting there, you know, and he's about to give rizq. That's, that's how he acts. Whereas Rasulullah comes and says, La, Ya, Ya Ali, Badak Binti, is that why you're coming here for? Is that why you, is that why you came here for? And he tells him, Naam, Ya Rasulullah, that's why I'm here. That's why I'm coming here. And he says, okay, let me just go ask Sayyid Zahra salam. Like we said earlier, Sayyid Zahra salam said no to every single person. 
Whereas when it came to Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi what she do? She stayed silent. And which was a sign of her acceptance. And Rasulullah says, Sukutuha alamutu ridaha. Her silence is a sign that she's accepted you, Ali. So he goes and he says, Do you have anything to give her? And he tells him, La wallah ya Rasulullah, ma'ande she. He told him, What about the shield I once gave you? He says, It is with me, but it's, it's not worth anything. Yani. It's worth 400 dirhams. And then Jibra'il comes and he tells him, Ya Rasulullah, what are you waiting for? I have already married Ali and Fatima in the heavens. Just marry him on the ground. What are you waiting for? Yalla, Ya Rasulullah. They're already married in the heavens. So yalla, do the right, right there. Yani, iktub iktab, yani. And then he comes and tells him, Ya Rasulullah, this is who I am. This is what I have. And Sayyidina Zahra alayhi salam accepted. She was silent. And Imam alayhi salam said, and they continued. So Rasulullah comes to Ali ibn Talib and says, Ya Ali, keep your sword and keep your camel. But take your shield to the market and sell it for whatever it's worth. That's all he asks. For that's, for, uh, that's the mahar for Sayyidina Zahra alayhi salam. 400 dirhams, which is equivalent to 432 dollars, approximately, nowadays. Approximately around 432 dollars. So the Prophet began to iktab al -iktab, And Imam alayhi salam began to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what has gone. And then they finished the kat al and then you go, if you were to enter Halla, the house of Ali ibn Abi Talib al-Salam, this is what you find. According to Hadith, this is what you find in the, the house of Umar al-Salam. You find very humble furniture. The most they spent on was perfume, a few jugs, sheepskin. And that's it. That was the house of Ali ibn Abi Talib and Fatima alayhi salam. That was the house. Very humble house. According to Hadith, that's what they own. Basically, a farshe, you know, and a few things to die with, and that's it. That's all they had <coughs> at the beginning of their life. Now, let's come today to our day and age, and let's say how marriages are now, okay? You have to have a car, you have to have a shit or a house, okay? You have to have a house. You have to have a stable job. You have to be finished university. If not finished university, have your own company, one of the two depending on, you know. And, you know, everyone, everyone here knows the, the rest of the list. I'll ask a question. A 20-year-old man and a 16-year-old girl want to complete their religion. An 18-year-old girl. So, you know, say she's young and she's 18. How are you 20? She's 20 and he's 21. 21-year-old guy and 20-year-old girl, okay? And they want to get closer to Allah SWT. Allah tells them to get closer to me, there's a few things you have to do, but the main thing you have to do is get married. The command was for din. Everyone knows that. To complete half your religion, it's you, it's you getting married. It completes, and how, how does it complete half your religion? It tests your patience. It tests your will to become one with another. It tests everything in you. It tests how respectful you are. It tests how trustworthy you are. It tests how honest you are. It tests everything, every single good per quality you have in you that you think that's good within you, it comes and tests your marriage. Because essentially you become one with the person. Yeah, and for example, I'm single and I want to get out. I can get out. But if I'm married and I want to get out, I have to think, what about her? Or she has to think, what about him? What if she doesn't want to go? What if she's sick? What if he's sick? What if ma la khila? What if ma la khila? So that even though I really want to go out, I know I can't. So now I have essentially blocked my nafs from doing something it really wants to do because my other half. Completing half your religion, it's hard. So nowadays, what's blocking us from completing half our religion? A brother, and this, I know many stories as well, that would, a brother would come up to me and tell me, Wallah, ma'ashfi, man, I want to get married. Man. And this is this girl, and I love her, and she loves me, and whatnot. But her parents aren't letting us get married. Why? Because her parents want her to finish university. Her parents want her to be this, and her parents want me to be that. And, you know, it's like 
It's like Allah SWT has written guidelines for marriage and only the 21st century knew what these guidelines were. That's basically what it's like. Yeah? Only we know. You know, the time of the Prophet, Prophet Muhammad, Muhammad didn't know nothing, you know. So he comes and we're like, and I can't get married to her, man. Well, I can't get married to her because I'm still young and I can't, I have to, to actually have a stable job, I have to actually go through university and I have to study and whatnot. And that's Rahachi four or five years. And same thing for her. So what do we do? So essentially now the family, the parents, are blocking her from getting to know a guy, are blocking her from completing half a religion. By the way, obviously with the condition that they're both mature. So you don't come and say, oh, well, what if they're children? Of course they have to be both mature and know what they want in life. <coughs> so it's blocking, or the, the parents are blocking them from reaching, the, completing half the religion for what? For dunya. From the materialistic. And by the way, I don't mean don't, I don't mean don't be fussy about studying in university. You know, these are very important, and I'm sure that most of the sisters that study university have are studying with a whole heart, they're studying with pure intentions, they're studying with sincere intentions to get closer to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And, and, it, and I don't deny that for a second, but don't let that be your priority towards Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, because Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has written guidelines for you to reach to reach Him. And university isn't one, but getting married is. Don't let it be a barrier or a condition to, to get married. Obviously, with the factor of maturity, so no one comes and says, but what if they're children and they're led and you know, they can't get married and whatnot? Like, yeah, of course, they have to be mature and know, they have to know what they want. So, Rasulullah was very, in this, in this aspect, he was very he portrayed the concept and the quality of humility through letting his daughter say the Fatima salam, get married to Imam salam, but with him actually coming and opening the topic. Him coming saying, Ya Ali, you know contrary to our day and age. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Muhammad. We spoke around 10 minutes ago, 15 minutes ago, about what Ahl Makkah done to Rasulullah, correct? And how they exiled him, and how they hurt him, and how they used to spit on him, and how they used to throw rocks at him, and they used to dig drenches, and they'd make him fall, and they used to call him names, and they used to call him magician, and they used to call him this, and they used to call him that. They used to hurt Rasulullah in many ways, in very different ways. But Rasulullah was at the state where I have to just be patient and I have to get strong because Islam is still in its foundation period. So he was patient. So he let it go. But a question arises. What if Rasulullah becomes strong and he gets power? What would he do? Would he treat them the same way he tra they treated him? Rasulullah goes, he leaves Mecca and he goes to Medina. To the Ansar and he begins Islam he strengthens Islam he begins their foundations properly with people that want him people that love him now he has tens of thousands of people right at his hand tens of thousands of people right next to him and that give their soul for us for Rasulullah like that so now Rasulullah is strong he goes back to Mecca what does he do does he go and call every single person names? Does he get Abu Lahab and Abu Sufyan and Abu Jahan and does he hang them? Does he hit them? Does he, what does he do? He comes and puts them together and he says, I don't want to hurt anyone. I do not want to hurt anyone. I don't want to shed blood. I don't want anyone to be killed. You have a couple of op options and accept if you don't accept, stuff. You can become Muslim, no one gets hurt. Listen to these options, huh? Because although Rasulullah is the leader, he still had companions from Mecca that were with him. And these companions went through what Rasulullah went through at the time when he was exiled. So these guys are dying for revenge. They want to kill these people. These, these people, what they've done to us, Allahu Akbar, we want revenge. So Rasulullah has to be very political at how he assesses the situation. So he tells him, 
It says, you have a couple of options. Option number one is you become Muslim. You become Muslim, no one hurts you, nothing, خلاص. Second thing is you leave Mecca. And if you leave Mecca, nothing happens as well. And it gives them third option, the fourth option, the fifth option. Well, like for example, another option is you stay at home and you lock yourself at home and you're not allowed to leave. For example, and no one hurts you. And it gives them all these options until the richest stage. You really don't want to hurt anyone, Ya Rasulullah. Huh? You really do not want to hurt anyone. And then he tells him, اذهب وأنتم الطلقاء I forgive you all. Rasulullah sallallahu had, he had, he had basically surrounded Medina, uh, Mecca. He had complete control over Mecca. Not one person could move without Rasulullah knowing. Not one person. Not one person. These people that used to call him names and hurt him and do everything that they, 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 they done to him, he had complete control of them and he told them, اذهب وأنتم الطلقاء I forgive you for what you've done. Rasulullah portrayed forgiveness. He portrayed that the, the concept, the reality of forgiveness. He showed us it. He didn't come and say, Wallah, you have to be forgiving. He showed us through the people. He showed us in the hardest, the hardest. You know, for example, if someone will come to come to us in nowadays, nowadays, Wallah, he came and he slapped me. He darabni saqsuh, for example, like we said in Arabic. You know, he slapped me and he left. I may hold a grudge for months. I may hold a grudge for years. Because how did he disrespect, he disrespect me in front of my friends? I'm going to hold a grudge for a long time. Someone comes and, Allah, you know, speaks to you in a bad way in front of people. How did he swear at me? How did he swear at me? I will never forgive him. And many of us know many stories. I'm telling you, Rasulullah. We explained what he went through and he came back and he told him, I have forgiven you. I have forgiven you all. Leave. Forgiving. <coughs> and then a final story and I will conclude with this inshallah. Is that there was a war and Rasulullah had an army in the composition, composition of the army was the Ansar, which was the companions from Medina and the people that came from Mecca. So you know how we said that Rasulullah came back to Mecca and he, told, he gave him options and from these options were that you become Muslim. So some of these people from, from Mecca became Muslim. So these became some of his companions. So when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi went to war, he had this army, a majority of the army was the Ansar, and a minority of, minority of the army was Ahl Makkah. Okay? So he goes, and they win the war. But what does Rasulullah do? He goes, and he tells them that the spoils of war are for Ahl Makkah. Not for, Ahl, not, not, not for the Ansar. The Ansar are the people that came and saved Rasulullah. The Ansar are the people that came and accepted Rasulullah in Medina. If it wasn't for the Ansar, Rasulullah would have, wouldn't have anywhere to go. But he comes and says, the spoils of war don't go to Ansar. They go to Ahl Makkah. So uh, Ahl Ansar, the Ansar come and they start talking. It becomes like a dajji, you know. What's Rasulullah doing? Should he forgot what we've done for him? And they start to question. And they start to... And then Rasulullah hears and he goes to him and he asks him, he says, What happened? You're the Mu'mineen. And he starts to, Iftikhir fi him. He starts, You guys held me when no one held me. You guys done this when no one done that. You guys have these qualities. You guys are Ahl al Karam. You have this. And then Ansar, Ansar begin to cry. Because they felt that we hurt Rasulullah. We hurt Rasulullah with talking about the spoils of war. We hurt him. So he begins to talk and talk Antum this and Antum that and Antum this and Antum that. These people, Ahl Makkah, are Ahl Dunya. So I satisfy them with Dunya. But you, Ahl Medina, you, the Ansar, are Ahl Akhirah. I can't satisfy you with, with Dunya. I never, thought, I never thought I could satisfy with Dunya, to be honest. 
Rasulullah standing up. And I began to cry, and they kept on crying, and Ruhi lak al fida ya Rasulullah. And they continued, and then, and then he says, whatever you want, anabil khidmi. You want the spoils of war, I'll get you for my own money and whatnot. And he continues, and then they begin to cry. He shows us, Rasulullah, in this, how thoughtful he is. He shows us how thoughtful he is because he felt like these people are mudday in. These people are sad. These people are hurt. What can I do to fix this? What can I do to fix this situation? So he goes and speaks to them about how high they are. He speaks to them about their qualities. Into this and into that. And if someone comes into, if I were to tell you you're a good person, it's different to a person like an imam coming to tell you that you're a good person. It's two different compliments. So when Rasulullah is giving him these compliments, it's much higher. And then you have a person like Ali al-Akbar alayhi salam. Let's go to Karbala. Ali al-Akbar alayhi salam is a son of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. The son of Layla. Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam says that there was no one and there is no one that looks like Rasulullah as, as much as my son Ali al Akbar alayhi salam. To the extent where if we were to want to remember Rasulullah, Ida Shtakna ila Ruyat Rasulullah, ila Jaddi Rasulullah, Nadarna ila Ibn Ali. We looked at my son Ali. He says that Ali, my son, has the mannerisms of Rasulullah, had the looks of Rasulullah. To the extent where people would actually, didn't Rasulullah pass away? You know, what's, what's happening? Is history repeating itself? That question. Ya sahib al-asri al-fu'adu Ya sahib al-asri al-fu'adu tafattara Libn al-Husayn towards 
the heavens and said, Ya Allah, you be the witness that I have sent this young man to the battlefield. You be the witness that I have sent this young man to the battlefield to wage war on the enemy. He is the one who is most similar to your Prophet Rasulullah. And whenever I used to be eager to see Rasulullah, I looked upon his face Oh Allah Deprive them from the blessings Because they have invited me With the promise of supporting me Instead they arose against me They want to spill my blood
قد قضى أحشى الظما والثرى فأجاب فأجاب عد يا بني إلى الوغى يسقيك جدك من يديه الكوثرى علي الأكبر عليه السلام وانت ذو his jihad in a rush as he was the bravest how could he not be the son of Imam Hussein alayhi salam Ali al-Akbar despite his thirst three days with no water he was untouched by the enemy he came back to his father and asked my father my father, the thirst is killing me, and this armament is hurting me. Is there a cup of water which would give me strength? Our Imam cried, Imam Hussein cried and said, My son Ali, my son. Continue to battle, it will not be long, it will not be long before your grandfather Rasulallah brings you a cup of water after which you will never feel thirsty again. Oh my son, go back to the battle. فغدا يقر على العدو مصبرا وإذا به يرميه رمحا غادرا وحاطت الأعداء فيه قد قطعوا As Ali al-Akbar returned to the battlefield, he battled a fierce battle and killed many of the enemies. Some narrations say as many as 120. As Ali al-Akbar fought the cursed enemy, as he is in the middle of the battle, a spear pierces his blessed chest and he falls to the ground. As he falls to the ground, it breaks and leaves the metal in his chest. When he fell, they knew they couldn't fight him while he was standing. They knew this is the son of Abi Abdullah. They had to get him to the ground so they can take him out. They started to hit them with their swords. And one hit him on the head. Ali. to the heart of Imam Hussein. Every time one of the companions or the family members was about to leave this world, they called out, Ya Hussein. Nada, ya, ya, nada. Nada, ba. Kod sakan al-Mustafa. من كأسه الوفا شربا شربا طاهرا He cried out, O Father Like you said, Rasulullah has quenched my thirst And he says he is waiting for you فَجَابَهُ السِّبْتُ الشَّهِيدِ مُلَبِّيًا وَرَاهُ جسما
الاسمان بالسيوف مقطعة نادى نادى على الدنيا على الدنيا العفا يا مهجتي على الدنيا العفا يا مهجتي فقد استراح من الهموم مبكرا وصل اليه الامام الحسين وحط خد على خد وصدره فوق صدره إمام حسين عليه السلام قد استحسن علي الأكبر يبوت السجيك عن علي الأكبر السجيك He says oh son oh my son it is time for you to go it is time for you to go يا نور عيني Imam Hussain noticed the head on his head and it broke Imam Hussain's heart to see his son in that state. Imagine you see anyone you love in that state cut up into pieces. You look at their head, you see a bruise, they're bleeding. Imam Hussain said, Oh my son, who hit your head? Yeah, 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 yeah.